Hello everyone. I guess you can hear me loud and clear, right? Yeah. Excellent. So um, my name is Per Buur. I lead a company called Include OS. Uh, and Chris asked me to do a talk about uh, configuration and union kernels. Uh, I think it will be mostly conceptual. Uh, I think like my goal for this talk is for you to understand something other than uh, Unix or Linux systems. I think ImcludeOS is interesting in that it's based on completely different ideas than what all the sort of traditional operating systems are. Uh, since I started working with it, I sort of really can't see the architectural differences between Windows, Mac OS and Linux anymore. Uh, and I, that difference used to be very important for me back in the day. So, configuration management of unikernels or fish and unicycles. How and why? Uh, so I, I started asking myself these, these fundamental questions like, like What's the point of a configuration file? Why, why do we have configuration file files? Is, is anyone wants to take a stab at, at that one? I mean, we're here at. We like YAML. Could be, uh, yeah. So the proposed answer answer was because we like YAML. That's one thing. Uh, anyone here remembers applications that didn't have configuration files? By the way, there was a quite a few of them in the sort of early 90s that you would download and you would edit the source code and compile it and it would run. The actual, and that, I find that interesting that we have, those are completely gone and now everything has configuration files. So if you try to look on sort of the architecture of a compute, computing system, it's a bit like this. You have your operating system in the bottom that's vendor supplied, somebody else supplies you with it. You have your program code, your application, Postgres, whatever, and you put your local adaptations in the configuration file and it processes data. And the nice thing about sort of this approach is that your local adaptations, they persist across upgrades of both program code and operating system code. So that's nice. Yeah. Uh, why, how, how, how did we get to this sort of design that we currently have? Uh, so we can start, if you roll really, really far back and sort of look at systems how they were 60, 70 years ago. Um, it was punch card systems. Now I'm not old enough to sort of have used any of, of them myself, but I've, I've read a bit about them. Uh, with regards to operating systems, they were quite interesting because they were... They were very, very efficient systems. They were basically single task systems, so they only do one thing at a time. So let's say that you had some sort of compute need. You'd write a program. It would be written to these punch cards. You write data that would be written to these punch cards. And you get a time slot maybe from like 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, if you're a student, that's what you likely would get. And your punch cards would be loaded into the computer. It would do the compute. <laughs> and uh, it would uh, proceed to the next phase. It was very, very efficient. You had the whole computer at your disposal for that time. Uh, there were some other bad things about it, like the user experience of forgetting a semicolon on line five is really bad because the, the, it wasn't really agile. And then we have uh, these guys, that's uh, Thompson and uh, Richie, who did uh, Unix back on the that's a PDP-11 in the background there, uh, where the idea was basically to try to sort of share a compute resources amongst multiple users. I think one of the main things they also tried to address was that the system would be an online system so that you wouldn't submit batch jobs, you would actually work interactively towards the system. That means that you have to share that system amongst multiple users because these were I think the starting price was, was $50,000, which was extremely cheap for a computer that was in its completely unusable, unusable uh, configuration. So the usable configuration was $100,000, and that was still considered very, very cheap. Anyway, they created Unix. 
So first, and the interesting thing is, is when we try to look at sort of the way that it's configured, it was written as a sort of third party operating system. Now, so you would have a blank computer and you would build that computer up and install the operating system on it. And you would then use that operating system on the computer to configure the computer. Now that's usually the way I've always worked with almost all of the computers that I've worked with. Yeah. Uh, the, the one notable exception was at some point uh, uh, we bought a couple of mini machines. So that's AS400 or, yeah. Uh, and those actually had, the, the, the interesting difference was they were not self-managed. You actually had to buy a computer which sole task was to manage the other computer. Because you had separated the sort of admin plane from the actual compute stuff. Because what we have today, like all of our operating systems, they're self-modifiable operating system. The operating system itself can and no, does know how to manage itself. Uh, and that's, I think, that I, th I think that's, that's interesting because it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Uh, because we could look at a sort of compute system that could potentially look something like this, where you have some sort of, of external administration plane that would then provision up these computer resources and they would run. And if you want to change stuff, you go through the admin plane and that is separate from the data plane or the compute plane, if you want. Yeah, and there are some obvious advantages to doing it this way. I mean, like, I think the two most, most uh, uh, obvious ones are that this design in itself is quite secure. Because, like, uh, somebody attacking that system, like, I don't know the stats, but I guess most of what people want is your network and compute power. That's why they attack you. Um, and they rely on remote execution bugs to sort of take control over a system, subvert it, and do your bidding. But if that system is unable to alter itself, that becomes really, really hard. Even if you have remote code execution, you can't really do anything with that system. Yeah. The other bit is, of course, there's less need to ensure that the target system does what it's supposed to. There's no drift because the system itself can't initialize change. Uh, I have quite a bit of time, so comments and questions, by the way, are, are, are welcome. So, okay, now that's, that's done, uh, over to something completely different. I just bring this up as a, because it's, I used to work uh, with Varnish for approximately 10 years. Uh, it was really fun. And one of the cool things about it is the, the way that they do configuration. So, uh, anybody here worked with Varnish? Yeah? Yeah, that's a, I guess one, one, one quarter of you or something. So the interesting thing about Varnish is the way that it deals with configuration. So instead of having a traditional configuration file that's some sort of YAML that we all <laughs> love, or uh, it has this, this built-in script that's basically when you configure it, that script gets transpiled on, uh, into C code. That C code gets then compiled into a shared object. That shared object is then executed. So every transaction Varnish does, it actually sort of runs that code through your configuration. Now that, it, one of the things that's been really disappointing with working with Varnish for 10 years is that I really liked that design pattern. And nobody else cared, <laughs> seems to have, nobody else picked that up. Uh, which I think is sad because I think it's, it, it made for, it gave us a lot of advantages. One thing, it was, it was really, really performant. It also made the code naturally uh, modular because we could add functionality and if you didn't invoke that functionality, it would have zero cost. So you wouldn't pay for what you didn't use, which I think is a great, uh, yeah. 
design principle. Okay. Yeah, so Varnish looks, yeah, the configuration looks a bit like this. This is the default built-in configuration. Currently Varnish, you likely can't see it, but it's basically just if the re request method is get, we do this. If the request method is that, then we do something else. Okay, so now on to include OS. So what's, what, what is include OS? So include OS is mostly, it's a library. So it sort of consists of various things. So there are, there's memory management in there. There's an IP stack in there. There's firewall code in there. And it's all library functions. It's written in C++. And the way that you build an application with it is you take your application and when you compile it, these libraries get injected into the application itself. Uh, so that means that your web application now has, in addition to having a web server injected into it, it also has an Ethernet driver injected into it. It also has an IP stack injected to it. It's completely standalone. Last thing that sort of happens is that we slap a bootloader on it, and then it spits out a binary image, and that image is now bootable. So your application now runs sort of bare metal or bare virtual metal or, or, or whatever you'd like. That's the whole idea of, uh, of unikernels. Uh, we're not entirely faithful to the idea of unikernels. We do things like uh, support multiple cores, uh, and we've write it in C++, and most others have been written in a sort of Haskell or OCaml or another high-level uh, esoteric language. Um, yeah, so I, I can see if I can sort of uh, show you what this looks like. Um, yeah, so I'm just writing a simple uh, file with just a bit of uh, C in it. Yeah, so cat, by the way, is underutilized as an editor. It even has light editing. So sort of, I, I, I consider myself neither part of the Emacs or VI clan. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that, this is the minimum, m minimal include OS application. Um, yeah, it just boots up and print, prints hello. Oh, really? Print Damn it. <laughs> I've done this like 20 times now and I managed to get it right every single time. <laughs> I know, I know, but uh, I don't have said in my fingers the same way I have the editors. Okay. So now, yes, that's a good question. What it does is it compiles the operating system and fires up Camu and boots up my application. So this is what include OS look, looks like. And at some point here, is basically the generic code stops running and my hello world runs. Yeah. Um, yeah, boot, is, we, we were a bit cheeky by sort of grabbing boot, but there was no other Unix command named boot. So we thought like, why the, why the hell shouldn't we be entitled to taking that? But okay. <laughs> Okay, so this was a separate uh, virtual machine, by the way. Okay, so a, a bit more about what, what actually happened now. Uh, so we have a bunch of libraries. 
as I told you. And, and typically the biggest difference when we compile this application is that instead of like a system call, we actually replace that system call with a function call. And that injects some kernel code. That is the biggest difference. Uh, like mostly everything else is quite the way you used to, uh, except that we do everything statically. So we use uh, Muscle, uh, the C library, that, and interestingly enough, Muscle is written specifically for Linux, uh, which is why we, li we like it, because it provides us with a good layer of compatibility. Uh, but, so everything is the same, except for at the end of Muscle, Muscle typically calls into the Linux kernel. What we do, we call into uh, uh, some library code. Yeah. So then there's a bunch of scripts that sort of links this together, slaps on the bootloader. Uh, yeah, so rather in a complex uh, build system. Was that uh, reasonably clear? Yeah. So the key characteristics of these systems, I mean, you have one thing is you have the reduced uh, attack surface. Uh, one of the, <laughs> my favorite example of sort of yeah, attack surface and its cost was, I don't know if you guys remember, I think like a year and a half ago, there was like a bug in the reference Bluetooth implementation. Uh, and that code had been copy and pasted into every single operating system. And like, so yeah, so the kernel org guys put out a new Linux kernel, the vendors basically took that code, put it into and issued new kernels. And I don't know how many systems were booted as a result, but I think like, <coughs> Likely, Red Hat and Ubuntu put out new kernel images, and then every single virtual machine in Amazon reboots, even though none of them have Bluetooth attached hardware. But they still boot because there's a kernel coming out, and 95% of the sysadmins out there, but there's a new kernel coming out, you schedule a reboot. You really don't, there's the upside of like postponing is, is, is not really big, uh, big enough. Yeah, it's self-contained, so completely statically linked. Uh, so, yeah, I saw there was there's this research project from IBM it does this cool thing with unikernels, where they they run them inside of processes, uh, because process isolation and VM isolations, they're basically identical. They're, the difference between them is mostly practical. Uh, they have. Sif um, you have single uh, address space, it's an, basically an address space. The, the only difference is that you exit that address space uh, with a system call, or if it's a VM, you with a VM call. And then you go into to an, another mode of operations. Anyway, these IBM guys, what they did was they used the self-containment part of the unikernels to run an application completely inside a process. And they use seccomp to basically lock down that process so it couldn't open files or couldn't basically do anything except hang on to the initial file descriptors it booted up with. It's called uh, NABLA containers, if you want to look into it, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, it's also, these systems are very predictable because they're basically one static image. It's one static system instead of what we usually used to, which is two systems that are both more or less dynamic. So typically when you have something like Postgres running on top of Linux, you have two dynamic systems that interact. They're basically orbiting each other. Uh, and that of course means that and they're both very dynamic in nature, so that one will try to adapt to the other which basically means that there, there are very little predict, pred, predictability. Of course, if you run something like ImcludeOS on top of a hypervisor, a regular hypervisor, you, you won't have any predictability at all because the hypervisors are extremely unpredictable. Yeah, it's also performance. It's quite resource efficient. Um, you run in the same address space all the time and you basically run this single instruction stream uh, and you don't switch in and out of kernel mode all the time. 
which basically means that things like speculative execution works really, really well. You could, you, the instruction cache is really, really happy all the time. Because it, it knows what's coming down the pipeline. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you'll understand why in a, in a minute, why I will, I will talk about this. But one of the things that, that we struggled with initially was that it was quite cumbersome to debug or to, to iterate on these systems. Because, so let's say that uh, we've wrote an application, web server or something, and we wanted to test it, maybe we test it in Google, the Google Compute Cloud, uh, and then we had to reprovision for every, every test with a new uh, disk image. And that took like five minutes, which is, doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're iterating, it's really boring. <coughs> so, we have one thing, another thing going for us, is that everything is in a single address space. Which means that the things like a TCP socket is really just an object in memory. Unlike on a Linux system, where it's God knows what inside the kernel. And you have no idea what's going in there, you don't have any APIs against it, and you, you, you can't really tell what's going on. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Whereas in, if everything is in single address space, you have access to everything, which basically means you can do these nifty little tricks. So, let's say that this is a map of your memory. You have your current application running there, it's completely fine. And you decide you want to write a new version of that application, you do so, you compile it. So one thing that happens when this application boots up, is that it connects to sort of a master node, the node that tells you whatever it's going to, to do. And when you, you can then, that node can then push down a new image, a new version of the application that you're running, and it can reside in memory along with the current version. But what we could do then is we have callbacks in place so we can store state. So for instance, the networking stack can store its state, so it, the current TCP connections are stored. Or, yeah, if it's a firewall, it will have yeah, more connection tracking, etc. And now, basically, we can just long jump into the new application. We can just execute it. And when we're done, we can resume the state and we can continue where we left off. We can sort of discard the temporary state and the old application. Now, the cool thing about this is that we've managed to actually replace 100% of the code running on the system, uh, basically without down, downtime. The downtime here is, of course, when we execute the new image like from restore the state till we have done executed the new image and restore the state. That is, uh, we're not handling interrupts while we're doing that, so that we're, if in effect, we're, we're down. That's about five uh, milliseconds on a modern computer, if we run on bare metal. If we do on a virtualized system, it's a bit more. It can be maybe as much as 80 or 100 milliseconds, because emulated PCI buses are really, really slow. Yeah. Was that understandable? Yeah. It, was it? Yes? What are you doing with any sort of cache that you have there? Or you do cache in So the question was, what do we do with all the cache that we have there? Uh, we basically, so currently, we don't do I.O. intensive applications. Yeah. So like, we don't have a page cache. So, <laughs> so we, but, but uh, I can tell you, like most of the TCP buffers, mm -hmm. we discard. We, 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 we keep what we need to keep, so TCP gets a little kick in the head whenever we do this, and we'll stutter a bit, and there might be some retransmits and so on. So it's not completely smooth, but we do that in order to not have to save too much state. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically sort of the include OS primer, and now we sort of can see sort of the goal of that talk is to, to sort of talk about how we actually manage applications on top of this. So, 
One thing that you noticed is that the operating system basically has to be rebuilt for each deployment, uh, which is fine because as you remember from my hello world example, it took like half a second to do so. That's because most of the operating system is already compiled. It's compiled ahead of time, so a bunch of static libraries that are basically just, so the only thing we need to do is link. But since we re rebuild the whole operating system on each deployment, why do we need configuration files? Can we deal with, have maybe have tried to have, not to have configuration files? So we did try that. So we created something called NACL. It's not a configuration language. NACL is a bit overloaded as a name, I know that, but uh, okay. It's basically a, a domain specific language for network appliances. Uh, it's not Turing complete, it doesn't have loops. Uh, so it, we know that it, we're reasonably sure that execution will finish once we start. Because that means that we don't have a sort of security layer beneath it. So if there's an endless loop, we don't really know how to get out of it. Because the operating system itself doesn't know how to interrupt itself. Yeah. And as with BCL, we transpile this into C++. We compile it and link it into the application itself. Oh, yeah. So let's look at what, what, what this actually sort of, what does this look, what does this, uh, what it looks like. So, yeah. So there, there's this, this is basically a firewall. Uh, so it has a couple of uh, interfaces. One is called outside, the other one is called inside. The index there is basically where it resides on the PCI bus. Uh, so for the, <laughs> the recommendation there is to use the MAC address to identify it uh, as it's a bit more reliable than, than the index. Uh, and there's a router object. Uh, yeah. It's a matter of opinion or not whether that should be automatically created. We currently believe that it should not be automatically created. It could be created because most of the information there is derived from the interface definitions. Uh, but then again, you, you don't want systems to route unless you're really certain that they're going to route. So that's why we have it manually. Yeah, there's some syslog there. And then there's a bunch of, of basically definitions. So there's a single bastion host, there's a list of allowed services, and there's a, a, a list of our allowed hosts, which is basically created with an IP range. And then we start doing rules, and the rules basically, semantics are more or less completely stolen from IP tables, except the, the syntax is completely different. Uh, for instance, we have if statements. So if statements are one of my favorite things in configuration files because they actually make stuff a lot simpler. Yeah, so here if the connection tracking state is established, then we syslog it and we accept that package. And that basically as with IP tables, that sort short circuits the processing of that specific packet and we go into the accept state and let that packet pass through. Yeah. And if the the next one is this one, where if you're coming from the Bastion host, then we just accept it, no questions asked. And then this is a, like a cost, really. It, well, that's what's happening on the backside here, is that we actually cast this into a TCP packet. So if it's a UDP packet, it will not get into that block. And then it asks if the IP.destination address is in the allow host range, and the TCPD port is in the allowed services, and then we just log it, and then we accept it, yeah. I think you, you get it. And this is basically just... Question? Yes? Do you support IPv6? Um, so we merged IPv6 into a dev branch on Tuesday, <laughs> last week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, we do have to support IPv6. We don't have a proper release on it yet. Uh, one of the really bad things about doing your own operating system is like uh, it's actually quite a bit of work to implement those things. 
Uh, yeah. So I, I had the other day a colleague, a colleague, ex colleague of mine, wanted to use this, and he used OSPF v3. He wanted us to implement OSPF v3. Uh, I had a look at the RFC. It's 165 pages, which uh, typically sort of our developers they can implement 50 to 100 pages of RFCs per year. <laughs> so that's uh, 165 pages. It's, it's a lot. So we're not going to support. OSPF v3. Anyway, yeah, so we, basically just we just use the same as before to compile it and then we can basically just run it. It's a firewall so I'm not really going to demonstrate how it works because I think it just, oh, oh yeah, yeah, it booted up and now it has these firewall rules and I could create the system with virtual machines and telnet and then telnet would stop working because I put a firewall rule in place. But yeah, you can all just imagine that in your heads and we will just move along. Performance. Now this was one of our, my thesis when I was working with, include, uh, with Varnish was that the, 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 that the output of that the processing the configuration would be faster. So a master student at Oslo Metropolitan University did his master's thesis on comparing include OS with with the uh, Linux. And so we the one who, we start a bit higher than than Linux does. Uh, I think is because we when we compile we we don't actually use the entire IP stack. So we see that we're going to forward a packet. It doesn't really go up the, it doesn't even enter into TCP. Just sort of we take the packet off the networking card and we put it on the other networking card. Because, because it's a compile time decision to do that, so we can do that quite efficiently. Uh, but the interesting thing is that Linux will start to suffer as you add a number of filter rules. Uh, and you can see sort of specifically here at around 1500, between 1500 and 2000 rules, the performance dips quite significantly. So what's happening here is that these IP tables are placed in a linked list. And as that linked list grows, every, it gets traversed for every packet. And there's a lot of random reads because that rule references an IP packet here and an IP packet there and some state over here and completely trashes the, the, the CPU cache. And also the list itself, I think, doesn't fit into the level one cache at this point. And that's why sort of performance drops down. Now, I'm a big fan of, of Linux, and I, I don't do this to sort of, to talk shit about Linux, but, but we have our implementation there was basically a lot simpler than there was. And we did ha actually, we have not spent five minutes on performance yet. Uh, and, and we do, and it's basically because the compiler really likes <laughs> what we do and the CPU really likes what we do. Because we get that processing sort of in line. So you can sort of imagine this sort of CPU being this, this machine where you, that if you, you feed it binary code. And when you write your code like this, everything that the CPU needs to take that decision gets sort of fed into the, uh, into the sort of binary instruction stream and, it, uh, and sort of the speculative execution and all that works really, really great. The CPU has everything that it needs to take that decision when it needs to. Uh, the, so there are two lines there. One is for, for Linux, you can see them very distinctly. One is for Linux on source, that's source addresses. And the other one is for destination ports. So anyone would like to guess why filtering on Linux ports is significantly slower than on source addresses? Yes? I guess uh, because the kernel has to traverse two links then. It's a, actually a module. So the TCP in IP tables is a module, so it gets another sort of another call into a module, and then some other code that needs to be executed. Yeah. 
Uh, you could probably compile this, but this was the just default Ubuntu. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I, I think like, like I'm not, this is not like the first time somebody sort of showcased this. Uh, and I do feel that I think that eBPF will completely radically change this. So what eBPF does for the Linux uh, firewall performance is equivalent to that. So we've, we've done tests with the eBPF as well, and then Linux is completely flat. It still starts like 10-15% below us, but, but it's at least it sort of scales well. So how is this thing deployed? So, so we've worked with, so we, this has been in production for approximately 12, 13 months. That's how long it's been done. So what, what, one thing we do is, is we build a version of Include OS that only supports this live update thing. Like it doesn't have any other code there. There's no web server, there's no firewall, there's nothing. Just the live update. And we could have, of course, called it a container because it would sort of be a nice, it's actually, that's what it is. It's an empty container that you can sort of live deploy code on top of. Uh, but it, we call it a Starbase. And that's how we actually deploy it, is that, so the, the customers running this is running vSphere, so ESXi-based hypervisor with a sort of pretty heavy overlay on, on top of it. And they have basically a, a VM template that contains this empty thing. And then whenever it sort of boots up, it establishes this connection to the master node. And that's put over a TLS connection or something. And then it's basically a blank container that we can do whatever you want to do. And then it's connected to, perhaps it's connected to the internet and connected to a couple of servers. And of course, this is all software defined these days. So that's only a couple of API calls into vSphere. And then an admin comes along, uh, creates a firewall rule set or whatever, or actually that part is automated as well. So that the rule set is likely just generated out of their configuration database. An image is built and is put use that function, the live update functionality, and it sort of magically turned that system into a firewall. That's the way that we, uh, that's the actual process that we go through when, when this is used in a uh, production environment. So you can see that we sort of, we, we've, we've taken this, this live update mechanism, and we sort of basically use it as a way to not have configuration files. And we compile everything into the application itself. And since, yeah, we haven't still seen the need for configuration files, except that when we do uh, existing applications. Yeah, there are a few differences, like how do you deal with the operating system crash? Uh, that was really interesting. What we figured out is that, I think, all the, none of the hypervisors care to clear a memory when you crash. So <laughs> what we do is we have a hook that gets run whenever we're in real trouble and the CPU generates an exception and we log what we think has happened into memory and then we reboot the system and when we come back up again we go and look at this specific place in memory and there's a crash report. It's actually really nice. Uh, it's a lot simpler than, than bare metal uh, kernel development used to be in the uh, 90s. Uh, GDB as well is, you should, it's available. Like if you're running on any sort of Kemu based system, Kemu has a built-in GDB support. So you can actually run the debugger inside of that application and you can single step and do whatever it is that you're used to doing you can also then step into the kernel side of things. So you, because typically you will just see the syscall, but here you can actually continue down into the kernel as, as well. We are considering making a GDB stub 
as a plugin so that you can plug it into other applications as well so you don't have to rely on on Camus uh, GDB. Security, I think it's a bit of a guess, but security is, I think is pretty pretty good. The system is unable to modify itself. Uh, so we had uh, security teams try to attack it, previous versions of InclusiveOS that were pretty shitty with regards to security, but it was really, really hard, even if they, f they found remote code execution, they couldn't really execute remote code on it, because like, like, like there's no system call, so where is the write call, or where is the read call, or, or all of that, all of, all, all of that data is hidden behind 64 bits pointers, so yeah, attacks, att att it seems to be pretty hard to attack it. Profilers and tracers, uh, so <laughs> one of the nice things is if you recompile the operating system all the time, tracing is trivial. Like the, the reason why sort of dtrace is such an amazing piece of engineering is that it doesn't require to recompile the kernel in order to enable the trace it uses this, these potential probes that are in there. But when you recompile the kernel all the time, or when you recompile the whole system all the time, actually having that trace be there is, is rather trivial. Yeah. There's also a, a built-in profiler, which just uses a stack sampler. So basically, 100 times a second, it'll kick off an interrupt, see what's on the stack, write it down, and then resume. Uh, execution, and that will give you a statistic view on on what's going on. And again, I mean, like like the eBPF is one of the coolest pieces of engineering to enter the Linux kernel over the last couple of years. But again, it's really cool. But you don't really need it if you're going to recompile all the time. Uh, performance, yeah, you get really great performance without much effort. Uh, like it says these indirections and things like that that screw up performance uh, and if you sort of do what we do then you you get really excellent performance without much effort and relying on the compiler the compiler helps us a lot like we turn we, I think we're in the face of turning on LTO which is link time optimization and so far we've seen a 10 to 30 percent uh, speed up which is great, which would take us years to do that kind of, uh, add that kind of performance, uh, yeah. I mean, it's not all the roses. <laughs> the effort of writing and maintaining your own operating system is pretty significant. Uh, but the application effort is a lot less than actually uh, we expected. So the person who wrote the firewall from start to finish spent three months on writing that firewall. Uh, and she has not done firewall code before, or that not really that much sort of kernel code. And she did it in three months. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, you get a lot of for free if you have a pretty decent design. Uh, and I think I can do questions now, if you have any. Yes. I didn't get a lot. How do you do how the mothership can connect if you're not using a hypervisor? I mean you're introducing Oh <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so that bit like this master node, how does it connect how does include OS connect to that? And where is does the hypervisor come into play? So we typically don't we don't see the hypervisor just as with a regular Linux based system. Hypervisor is there. It helps provision new computers. But ImcludeOS does not know if you're running on a virtual system or a hypervisor system. Like we use a VTD, uh, so hardware-based virtualization. And we can't really tell that we're running on, on it. Just that with the, as with as, as you, you you know. Uh, it's a lot simpler to create a computer on a system with a hypervisor than on without one because you don't have to rack a new server. Yeah, any other questions? Is it possible to write applications with language different than C++? 
Yeah, uh, so the question, question was, is it possible to write uh, applications in languages other than C++? Absolutely. Uh, so that's, so the closest thing would be C. Uh, so, but C relies on POSIX. Uh, and our POSIX support is there, but it's a bit minimalistic. So I would say currently we're in the state where most libraries compile, but whereas most applications don't. And some of them will never compile because they do things like fork, and we're never gonna do fork. Uh, we might do threads, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, that, so C is, I think, within reach. Uh, then, but like everything isn't written in C and C++, so what's next? So, we did, we have ported two uh, small language runtimes. So one was Lua, which took one day. And then we did MicroPython, which took half a day. Uh, but that was without connecting the networking stack. But it seems to be quite simple. And once we have a decent enough uh, POSIX support, I think we'll do Node. And if we can do Node, we can likely do WebAssembly, and then basically I think we'll have most stuff. But we, we're waiting for WebAssembly to figure out the host definition, the interface between the WebAssembly VM and the host, because that's currently undefined uh, outside of a browser. Yeah, so maybe in, uh, yeah, maybe in three quarters of a year or so, maybe we'll have the node support. We, we, we also got money last year to port to ARM from the EU. So the idea is to, to, to run on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, yeah, I think that'll be interesting because of its, it will have a predictable uh, uh, platform. So we can do real time stuff and such, such like that. Yes, any other questions? If you're interested, if you want to come down and have a chat, I'll be very happy to do that. Uh, if not, you can sort of reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, if you have views or if you just want to talk more about this, I'm really happy to take your call. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to me.